Today's speaker is uh, Professor Michael Noonan from the University of British Columbia, um, who was uh, formerly a uh, postdoc with me uh, and when I was at the Smithsonian in the US. So he was in the lab for what, three years, a little over three years. Um, Mike did his PhD at Oxford University before coming to the Smithsonian. Um, he is a quantitative ecologist by training and has worked on a range of different subjects, uh, including animal movement, um, and has uh, interest in also phylogenetic modeling, um, uh, the interaction of wildlife uh, and roads and, and, and various, um, various other things. So um, as kind of an interesting aside, when I was first uh, deciding to come to CASAS, Mike was going to come with me um, and, and be a postdoc here. But uh, he said on a, on a whim, well, you know, I, there's this job available. I'm just going to apply for, for that and let's see. So on his first try, he landed a tenure track professorship. So great for him, bad for me. <laughs> But, uh, but uh, the collaboration goes forward. So it's really nice to be able to have him here today, one of the first uh, live on-site visitors we've had uh, in, in quite some time uh, and uh, coming all the way from Canada, but by way of Munich. So today he'll talk about some of his uh, work in, uh, in animal movement, um, focusing on uh, using statistics to tease apart biological effects versus uh, statistical biases. So thank you for coming, Mike. Looking forward to your talk. Yeah, um, thank you everyone for being here, both physically in person and um, digitally. It's nice to be giving the first in-person talk I've given now in probably over two years. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of a change. Um, yeah, as Justin said, I've been working, uh, I, I was a postdoc in his lab for three years and we've been working together for over five years now or about five years. And um, the work that I've been doing with him and other collaborators is what I'm gonna be talking about today. And um, the main focus of the work is um, something that we like to call biology or bias. And um, as I'm going to show you, um, it's, it's, it's a line of research that's focused on working with uh, animal movement data, GPS tracking data, and trying to pull out estimates from these data that are of sufficient quality that you're confident that what you are reporting is actually a measure of biological interest and not something that's an artifact of some form of statistical bias. Um, for many more established fields, this is sort of like a routine thing that's not very challenging to do. There are proven methods, there are standards. Um, and so you come, you collect some data, you use the standard methods, and you're pretty confident that what you are going to be reporting is proper, is an actual estimate of something that's meaningful. With movement in ecology, it's very much not the case that you can be confident in um, the standards in the field. And um, I'm going to be going over sort of a little bit about why that's the case and some advances we've made in both developing methods for um, getting at those estimates and getting at um, reliable measures from the tracking data and also just in demonstrating why this is important because the, the demonstration of why these things are important are as, a, as a major limitation for uptake in the field of, of movement ecology. Um, so to give you a little bit of background about the type of work that I do uh, in my research group, um, I run the Quantitative Ecology Lab at UBC Okanagan campus. Uh, it's a new lab, quite small at the moment, um, but I'm pretty happy with the work that's been going on, and it's a good, good collection of people. Um, effectively, the age of my lab is the same age as Cassis, we, Justin and I branched off uh, to different institutions who are starting these things at more or less the same time. He's managed to pull in about 60 people to his, his group. I've managed to pull in three, but uh, it's okay. It's not a competition. Um, in any case, uh, what the research that we do is focused on um, falls 
along two complementary lines of research. And the first is this methods development program. And um, that's mostly what I'm going to be talking about today. And it's sort of this uh, inter intertwining relationship between developing methods, testing them, improving them, testing them again, seeing where they where they, they function, where they fall apart, um, and then um, making those methods uh, accessible to the broader community of ecologists who might not necessarily have a technical background to develop and implement these methods on their own. So um, very much focused on developing new methods for handling these uh, data, testing them to make sure they work, make sure they were, they were abundantly clear about when they work and when they do not work. And then also seeing uh, if we can improve their failures or improve um, computational efficiency and that kind of thing. Uh, and so that's one line of research. And the second line of research is focused on um, what I call macroecology, so large scale ecological problems and species conservation. So once these methods have been sort of developed and tested and refined and proven to be functional in a sort of controlled setting, we like to work um, on deploying them to answer real world problems and, and protect species and, and answer um, conservation oriented challenges in a way that best captures um, and best util utilizes animal tracking data. And the whole pipeline of the program is focused on um, improving and supporting evidence-based, sound evidence-based um, species conservation. Uh, one of the ways that I do this is through a pretty extensive network of collaborators. Um, so UBC Okanagan campus is right here. And um, over the past uh, decade or so, um, I've put together uh, an extensive network of collaborators um, pretty much everywhere in the world. Uh, and all these, these people are um, a mix of people like Justin and, and other people at like Cassis that I work with uh, who have strong technical skill sets. Others are sort of what we call muddy boots ecologists who go into the field and actually do the field work. Others are partners in, in, in with um, government or in NGOs who um, don't necessarily go and do the field work themselves, but work with, with um, developing policy and work with trying to actually implement the science. Um, so this broad network of people um, that I work with and people, institutions and, and government and NGOs um, ensures that the pipeline from, from data to actually getting something done is, is um, well, it's ensured through the, the broad range of people I, that I work with. And also um, the quality of it is assured by, by the fact that um, this network includes a whole range of people with a broad range of skill sets um, who are all specialists in their field and specialists in, in any piece and component of the puzzle that working with these data and, and implementing the, the strategies requires. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk um, primarily, as I said, about um, some of the methods that we've been developing for working with tracking data. In particular, I'm gonna focus on the problem of autocorrelation in these data and, and home range estimation. And the second thing I'm gonna talk about is path-derived latent variables and how you can estimate that. So for anyone not familiar with movement data, which I gather is maybe most of you, um, you may not be um, especially familiar with why people collect these data and, and what the purpose of these things are and what a home range is and why would you want to estimate it, what a path derived latent variable is and why, why that's of interest. So I'm just going to start with a bit of a primer on, on movement ecology, a short primer on it, and um, we'll get into that first. Um, so why, why animal movement? Why is this interesting? Why is this something that I and many other people have decided to devote their lives to studying? Well, the, the main thing is that movement and the way for any animal that moves, the way that they move governs all sorts of interactions. It governs how they, they interact with each other, whether it's how to find mates, how to find food, um, what, whether they're, they're competing with one another. It governs how they interact with their environment, um, you know, how they, they find these things um, by, by cues, where they go, uh, how they find shelter, um, where they might, might migrate to, 
And um, importantly, in this day and age, it also governs how they interact with people. Um, so that bottom picture you can see is a situation that is both not very good for the people in that picture and also not very good for the uh, animal in that picture. Um, so conflict with humans and in the way that in animals interact with humans is a really important um, piece of this puzzle. And it's governed very much by uh, the way that animals move. And um, beyond being something that's just interesting from a basic ecology and a basic science standpoint, understanding the way that animals move is also critical in, in sort of protecting them and protecting them given the biological biodiversity crisis that's ongoing. And um, also the, the conflict issues as well that, that um, these animals are, and, and people are, are experiencing. So if we know more about the way that animals move and how much space they need, we can more effectively design protected areas for them. And we can also sort of hope to manage conflict in some way, minimize road kills, minimize the rate at which these animals are predating on livestock uh, or, or crops. And they're also really, it's also really important to understand uh, how these animals are moving in, in the face of climate change and how that might impact their energetics and uh, the capacity for these animals to survive and thrive going forward. So given you know, the fact that animal movement underpins basically anything that an animal does and also underpins the science that goes behind protecting them, as you can imagine, um, it's, it's quite a popular field in, in the ecology and the ecolog ecological sciences. In fact, it's probably um, one of the more rapidly growing fields out there, uh, as you can see in this figure with, uh, that looks at the relative publication rate of more established fields of ecology in general and population ecology, which are sort of longstanding fields that have been around for decades, if not centuries, um, to movement ecology and animal tracking, which are relatively new fields, very young, um, but rapidly expanding. And um, one of the primary reasons for which they're expanding at that rate is not necessarily, or not simply the fact that the uh, movement governs all these important biological processes, but it's also um, driven by technological advances. So um, not too long ago, we were conceptualizing animal tracking collars as looking something like this, um, which, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, that might have looked like this fantastic new modern age, space age uh, piece of equipment. Um, but very, very rapidly, we are now at the point where um, instead of putting something that on an animal that will almost certainly result in the animal's death, um, we can track small songbirds in a way that has almost zero impact on these animals. And not only can we do it in a way that's safe uh, for very, very small animals, we can do it in a way where the quality of the data is much better than it's ever been before. So technology driven by advances in satellites and advances in cell phone and GPS um, technology have allowed movement ecology as a field to just skyrocket. Um, but there's a bit of a disconnect because um, the tools for collecting these data have been expanding rapidly. And we're now at a point where we can put a collar on a lot, a lot of species. Not some of the smallest ones, um, but even some insects have been tracked um, by some type of tracking technology. So the, the quality of the methods for collecting the data has been increasing exponentially. Um, the way that we work with these data, the way that we curate them and, and archive them is now um, it, was, it was a major issue in the early days, but now it's been standardized. And um, once you have a standardized format for methods uh, for, for, for data curation, um, you can have a lot of uh, advances in the field. So, you know, we get good data, we get really high quality data for a lot of species, and curate it well, and we have all these things standardized. Um, the challenge, though, is that the tools for actually working with these data have lagged behind dramatically. So for example, uh, this, this pen and paper, pencil and paper method for 
um, estimating uh, probability distribution from some tracking data from the 1940s before like computation power even existed is still the most abundantly used standard method for working with like, these high quality modern GPS data. Um, so a nearly you know, 80 century old pen and paper method for um, delineating data is, is the standard in the field. Um, and so really the statistical and methodological um, tools for working with these high quality data have not kept pace with other advances in the field. And that's, that's led to a major, major disconnect in data quality and, and um, data features and how these data actually get used in practice. Two of the, the main analytical challenges that this disconnect has been introducing is, um, well, the first problem is an inability to model the autocorrelation in the data. So when you go and you collect tracking data, GPS data on these species, uh, autocorrelation gets introduced into it. And, and it gets introduced into it by the sheer fact that um, there's only so much space ground that an animal could have covered in some finite period of time. And um, when you're sampling those data, uh, there's, there's just no way at a fine temporal scale, there's just no way that um, the, any, any two locations from one time to the next are likely to be uh, statistically independent of one another. And you know, when you're trying to work with autocorrelated data, um, as anybody knows from estimating, anybody in the statistical literature knows from estimating quantities, uh, your sample size is, is a very key ingredient when you're trying to estimate anything. Um, whether, whether it's like actual estimates of things like means or whether it's um, things like your standard errors, your confidence intervals on, on your, your um, estimates, your sample size is always getting fed into there and it's always um, an important part of those estimators. The problem though, is that when you have autocorrelated data, your effective sample size, so how much like actual information is being contained within those data is necessarily smaller than your sample size because there's some correlation, time-based time correlation in the data. And so um, when you have that disconnect between how much information is in the data and what your, you know, the number is, what N is, um, these estimators uh, can result in biased estimates, the standard errors and confidence intervals will tend to shrink much faster than they should. And so uh, you have biases introduced and you have false senses of almost certainly overconfidence in, in the quality of those estimates. So that's a major disconnect um, in the field of movement ecology because autocorrelation is a necessary component of um, time series and time series of locations. And yet it's a component that's almost um, universally ignored when you're working with, with tracking data. The second major challenge, um, not to say that these are the only two challenges, but the second major one that um, we're gonna be talking about today is the fact that a lot of these methods also conflate uh, sampling with some important part of the movement process. Um, effectively, what I mean by that is, um, you go out and you put a collar on an animal or a bird or, or a backpack on it and try to measure it, your GPS tracker on it, and you try to see where it's been going. Um, and you decide a priori, okay, I'm going to sample this animal every hour, every 10 minutes, every five minutes, every day, whatever, whatever it is. The statistical methods that are most routinely used tend to assume that you chose that sampling rate because the animal is making an important decision at that one hour or one day or whatever time step. Um, in reality, that's almost never going to be the case. Um, there are some cases where you can get lucky and you, that, that sort of ends up being okay. But in most cases, there's a disconnect between the sampling process and the actual movement process that is the animal is doing under, underneath. So you've measured it at some scale and you are just assuming that the movement process is also occurring at that scale. Um, and this sort of difference between um, 
uh, the sampling process, the movement process, or, or the assumption that these two are related leads you to this sort of um, situation where you have scale dependency in anything that you might end, estimate, such that if you change the sampling process, you necessarily get a different answer uh, from the exact same underlying movement process. And that's not necessarily recognized uh, or not necessarily given the weight that it should be given um, when working with these data. So these are the two sort of major challenges when working with movement data. Um, to tackle these challenges, uh, I have been working alongside uh, Justin Calabres, who many of you are familiar with now, and long-term collaborator um, Chris Fleming uh, for the past five years at sort of advancing this um, framework for working with these data, and more recently, um, two new postdocs here at Cassis, uh, Inesh uh, Silva and uh, Jesse Alston have been brought onto the team to sort of expand um, the people working on this project. Um, so we've been working together uh, to sort of build what we call the, the CTMM framework, the Continuous Time Movement Modeling Framework. And effectively, the way that this framework works is that um, you start off by um, estimating the movement process in a reasonable way, estimating the autocorrelation structures in a reasonable way, fitting movement models to the data, and then um, conditioning all your analyses off of this sort of initial um, modeling process. I'm not going to talk too much today about the actual movement pro modeling process. I know that that's where a lot of the, like, the meat and the bones of, of the CTMM framework lie. Um, but I'm going to talk about um, why, why it's important to sort of uh, work from a reasonable standpoint and, and treat movement data as an actual movement process and the benefits that we can get from doing that uh, when we're trying to estimate things of interest when um, when trying to learn about species or when trying to protect them. Um, yeah, so the first one I'm going to talk about is uh, autocorrelation. So that, the, the first main challenge, autocorrelation and home range estimation. So for anyone who's not familiar with working with movement data, what home range estimation is, is um, from a statistical standpoint, density estimation. You're trying to estimate a probability distribution. And um, what ecologists call this probability distribution is a home range. And what they um, relate it to is um, a distribution that quantifies the typical space needs of the species. So at the 95% quantile, you have a distribution that quantifies where an animal is likely to be 95% of the time. At 50% quantile, it's a probability distribution that quantifies where an animal is likely to be 50% of the time. So it's a problem that is well uh, fleshed out in the statistics literature for independent data by a kernel density estimation. Um, but with autocorrelated data, uh, it was not necessarily well um, resolved. In the ecology literature, um, it's a, quite a little bit more like the Wild West out there. Um, people are... There are many, many, many estimators. Uh, people are either borrowing them from the statistics literature, from the computer science literature, making them up as they go, um, doing things as simple as just drawing a box around your data and calling it a day. And um, anything from those very simple things to like really high level uh, complex machine learning algorithms applied to these data or black, black box methods as well. Um, are all, up, as you can imagine, resulting in very many different um, estimates on the exact same data. And there are a huge number of claims about the quality of how these things perform. Um, and they all result in pretty dramatic differences in the exact same data set. And yet, despite that, there's been um, very little objective, reasonable testing on, on how these things are expected to perform. And so the result is that despite the huge range of estimators out there and the quality with which they perform and the, resu and the results that they'll give you, uh, there are no standards. Um, and effectively what most people end up doing is just choosing one that results in the estimate that looks the best visually to what your a priori expectations of what the distribution should have looked like is. 
Um, one thing to note though, is that all but one of these different home range estimators that's in common use assume IID data, assume statistically independent data. The only one that does not is the one that's been developed um, as part of our research program by, by Chris Fleming back in uh, 2014. Um, so until 2014, until Chris um, worked this one out, there was absolutely no way to handle autocorrelated data in a home range estimation um, analysis. Um, why is this maybe important for home range estimation? Well, historically, um, prior to satellite tracking, you would have to go out into the field and um, you would have to actually manually collect your data. It was a lot of hard work. Data were collected at very, very coarse temporal resolutions because of the sheer manpower that was involved in going out and collecting it. And so you'd be lucky to get a handful of data collected maybe on a two, three day weekly basis. If you're really, really ambitious, maybe once every couple of hours, um, but generally speaking, very, very coarse data. Uh, with the advent of satellite tracking, of course, it became much more simple and easy and straightforward to locate animals. You didn't actually have to go into the field. You just pop the collar on and let satellites do the thing. So we could collect data much more easily. It became cheaper and easier to have an abundance of data. And so sampling resolutions increased. So historically, um, you might track an animal for a year and get something that looks like that back. So we've got X and Y coordinates here, and we've got a data set that looks a little bit like this. And the autocorrelation in it would be generally pretty weak. Um, so these are simulated data, and this is the simulated, um, the autocorrelation function on those simulated data. And you can see that um, the amount of autocorrelation decay is pretty, pretty rapidly in it. Um, so, you know, there's a disconnect between the fact that these are not perfectly IID data and the estimators are assuming that the data are IID, but it's not horrible, you know, it's really not too, too bad. Um, but as we, as, as technology permitted finer and finer sampling, we were able to fill in those gaps in the data. And, you know, although we're getting data now of, of a much higher quality, and you can actually not just see a point cloud, but resolve paths and trajectories and see just in the data how much more rich they are, autocorrelation is now absolutely not an ignorable problem. You have persistent autocorrelation in the data that persists for um, sometimes an entire data set it is correlated with the first point, depending on how it's been sampled. So that disconnect between the assumptions of the estimators and the actual like features of the data that are being fed into them was um, started off as not being too, too bad, but ended up to the point now where we're at a situation where it just absolutely cannot be ignored. Um, and this brings us to the actual amount of information that is in an animal tracking data set in relation to home range estimation and what that your effective sample size is here, your an effective is a function of how long you've sampled this movement process for and what the decay rate of um, autocorrelation, positional autocorrelation is in the data. So effectively the rate at which this autocorrelation is decaying, uh, tau p, uh, and a function of how long you've sampled it for, um, t. So t divided by tau p is, is an estimate of the effective sample size of these data. And so um, just bear that in mind as we progress forward with this piece. Um, okay, so, you know, there's a disconnect between autocorrelation being present in the data and, auto and these estimators assuming that the um, data are IID. Is that actually a problem though? You know, for some, some things, maybe abundant autocorrelation doesn't really matter. Maybe you can still estimate something reasonably with it. Um, so as good scientists, you know, uh, working on a problem you've never seen before, the first thing you do is turn to the literature. And uh, if you turn to the literature for this problem, you know, is autocorrelation a problem in density estimation? Um, is autocorrelation a problem for home range estimation? You, you see a number of studies on this particular problem. Um, very few of them have approached this problem in a reasonable way, but these three studies did. Uh, did so in a way that uh, at least allowed us to test and, and reproduce sort of what range of autocorrelation at lag one they looked at. 
So they looked at our effectively IID data um, up to um, data with uh, around 0.8 autocorrelation and like one in it, which seems like a reasonable amount of autocorrelation. And they all concluded that um, if you have this amount of autocorrelation in your data, really your estimates aren't too, too bad. Uh, they're not going to be super biased. You can effectively ignore um, autocorrelation in the data. Also note the age of these studies. These are like decades old studies um, before modern GPS really took off in the field of movement ecology. So these are at that early stage of that, you know, going out and collecting data out by hand and not having abundant autocorrelation in the data, long persistent autocorrelation. And although these studies are really quite old, they're still predominantly used uh, by people as, as the main means for saying, okay, uh, I don't have tracking data, but I don't have autocorrelation in them. The problem though, is that if you look at where autocorrelation is in most empirical study, uh, data sets, it's absolutely completely out of the bounds of what's been tested previously. And most of it falls on this upper end. Almost all of the data sets you see in, um, uh, almost all the autocorrelation you see in, in empirical data sets has perfect autocorrelation at um, time like one. And it persists uh, like we saw in the last autocorrelation uh, ACF figures. So um, again, here there's a disconnect between um, what people in the literature have told uh, are, are, are seeing about the impacts of autocorrelation on these data and where the actual data lie. And, you know, this is not like peanuts here. We're not talking about small differences in the quality of these estimates, including and accounting for autocorrelation in, in home range estimation and density estimation makes an absolutely massive difference. So here's um, tracking data for two Mongolian gazelles. The first one here uh, is, is just um, traditional kernel density estimation with the Gaussian reference function. And on the right here is autocorrelated kernel density estimation that was developed by um, Chris Fleming as part of the CTMM family of methods. And you can see that it makes an absolutely massive difference in um, what these distributions are going to tell you about anything about how, how these species behave, how much space they need, what their potential for interactions are going to be. Um, so it, it really has a really big impact on what we say about species. And yet, despite that huge impact, um, there's been very little rigorous testing. And most people say, um, you can just ignore it. Um, don't worry about it. Uh, so you know, to, to sort of remedy that situation, um, a few years ago, I uh, undertook a large uh, comparative analysis to look at the impacts of autocorrelation on home range estimation, on density estimation. And um, what I did was I collected um, a large multi-species data set uh, that at the time involved 27 species of birds and mammals and um, almost 400 individuals um, across all that. So to get a really good representative sample of the type of data that people working, were working with. And um, from those data, uh, what I did was um, an empirical cross-validation to see how these different estimators were performing. Um, so on the left here is a uh, traditional multi-density estimator. And um, uh, what I did with these autocorrelated data was half sample cross-validation. And this is just regular kernel density estimation um, bivariate with a uh, Gaussian reference function and the, the black contours, the orange points of the data. Black contours are um, the, the actual density, of the contours of the 95% quantile of the density estimate. And you know, this looks pretty reasonable, as you might, uh, you, you know, just looking at the data, this looks like a reasonable um, approximation of what this density looks like. And so you might think, you might look at that and be pretty happy with it. Uh, so that's regular KDE. And in comparison, AKD that handles autocorrelation gives you a totally, totally different estimate, much, much larger um, because the sample size is not artificially small. It's, it's corrected for the autocorrelation in the data. And uh, if you were to show this to any sort of ecologist who would be trying to estimate how much space this animal needs, um, they would tell you that this looks absolutely way too large. Look at all that empty space. There's no way the animals are going to be going there. There's no way that 
they, they went there way too big, no good. Get rid of that estimate. Let's go with this one. It's much better, it's much tighter. Um, but when it comes to cross-validation, the second half of this data set when cross-validated against the density estimate uh, performs really quite poorly. So the 95% quantile, this one particular data set resulted in only 49% um, appropriate, 49% uh, uh, cross-validation. Uh, whereas AKD uh, cross-validated at the 95% quantile with 93% um, relocation inclusion. So accounting for autocorrelation in the density estimate um, was resulted in cross-validation for these data that was far more accurate. In fact, you might actually say that it was a little bit too small, like this, this estimate actually needed to be a little bit larger. Um, you know, so this is pretty compelling on its own, this one example, but you might think, okay, I cherry picked an example. Um, in fact, I did. This is a cherry picked example just for this, this talk. Um, but I'll show you another. Um, so this is again, the same process with a different data set and the same cross validation here again uh, at the 95% quantile uh, density estimation on autocorrelated data when autocorrelation is ignored results in an estimate that is far too small and poor cross-validation. When you account for the autocorrelation, you get much better results, much better cross-validation. And so I ran this type of cross-validation across all those empirical data sets that I got, this half sample cross-validation. And um, for AKD, um, at the 95% quantile, I saw pretty much 95% of the re relocations included in this time. So AKD was cross-validating at the correct quantile constantly, consistently. And then um, I saw the exact same results as well at the 50% quantile. And you also saw this appropriate relationship between your effective sample size, how much information is in the data, and, and the variance in your estimates as well. And as the data became of higher quality, your point estimate was, was uh, appropriately um, fixed at the right quantile, but your variance was decreasing. Conventional uh, kernel density estimation, in contrast, resulted in substantial negative bias. You did have that asymptotic um, convergence to the appropriate um, cross-validation at really large sample sizes, um, but at smaller to intermediate sample sizes, there was persistent negative bias. And um, I ran this across all the different home range estimators that are out there in, in common use. There are more out there that I didn't test, but I, I only wanted to test the ones that were um, actively being used by a large enough portion of the community. And this same thing persisted throughout the entire um, range of things that I tested. At small to intermediate sample sizes, autocorrelation resulted in strong, persistent negative bias. And only with very, very large sample sizes could these things perform well. Um, and yet, despite this, uh, we've seen extreme resistance to the desire for people to use um, a method with um, good statistical properties. Um, and a lot of this is, uh, again, ties to this idea that um, a home range should be tight um, to the data. And so there's a, a conceptual hurdle that still needs to be um, passed by the movement in college literature. A major challenge though with this when you're trying to like go out and protect species is that, um, you know, there's, there's a correlative effect of this, this negative bias. So bear with me as I walk through um, a relationship here. What we do know about species and what's pretty well resolved is that larger animals tend to require larger space. They need more space. They have larger home range areas. Um, a correlative effect of that is that longer, larger home ranges tend to have uh, more persistent autocorrelation. So these are estimates from, from the same empirical tracking data set. And when you have bigger home ranges, you have much more persistent spatial autocorrelation. They just take much longer to cross, and that, that positional autocorrelation persists in the data for much longer. Um, because your positional autocorrelation time scale is what governs your effective sample size, you also have this negative relationship um, between the two. Longer autocorrelation in the data, uh, autocorrelation that persists for longer time scales in the data results in smaller effective information in the data, all else being equal. 
And so if you carry that over, um, you get a situation where body mass is actually, uh, there's, a, there's an actual relationship between body mass, how big an animal is, and the effective sample size um, based purely on these, these correlated, correlated relationships and not based at all on anything uh, in terms of, of how these data are sampled or anything like that. So um, just en masse average effect across the field, larger animals tend to have smaller effective sample sizes. Smaller effective sample sizes were also the areas where the most bias was seen in some of these other estimators. And also the estimators, these estimators are the ones that are in most common use. So the net result of that, the, these effects, is that if you're trying to go out there and protect a species and you, um, you go out there and you estimate, tra collect some tracking data and estimate home range on it, uh, larger species tend to have much more biased home range estimates um, than smaller species, all else being equal. And so these species um, that we are really trying to protect the most and have the largest space requirements and where things can, can go bad very quickly if they, uh, if their space needs are not met, are the ones that have the most statistical bias based purely on um, features of the data that are not being accounted for. Based not on anything to do with, with how we're going out and collecting the data, just based purely on, on these correlative effects. And so, um, you know, fortunately, there's a solution. Use AKDE. It's out there. It exists. Uh, unfortunately, um, uptake by the community for this has been slower than we would like. Um, a couple of extensions of this is um, because we have good uh, home range estimation, uh, home ranges describe where animals are going to be um, and where they're likely to be. It also means that we can more accurately now estimate uh, things like home range overlap and um, encounter location distributions. All of these things govern um, the potential for interactions among species. So as you can imagine, um, these two, these two, as I mentioned earlier, would result in very different stories about the potential for interactions of these species. But we do know now after this cross-validation test and, and the empirical analyses and simulation-based analyses that I ran was that this one is dramatically more accurate and consistently more accurate as well. Um, and so uh, we are using these, uh, one of the things that we're doing is using these methods to sort of reshape how we, um, what we know about how species are interacting based on improved statistical accuracy of the density estimation. Okay, um, I'm gonna go quickly through another problem that we've managed to solve, and that is uh, how to work and estimate, how to work with um, the paths that these animals are, have traveled and how to estimate latent variables of these paths. Um, so estimating, path derived latent variables is probably the second most routine reason for collecting animal tracking data. What I mean by path derived latent variables is um, you go there and you sample locations where you have our locations over time, but you actually don't know what the underlying path was. And then you're trying to estimate from the locations some type of other quantity, like the speed the animal traveled or um, how, how much time it spent in different habitats. So, uh, those, those quantities are, are latent variables of the actual um, locations themselves, and we want to estimate those. Uh, the typical way that people tend to estimate these things is by a straight line interpolation. And then from those straight line interpolations, calculating quantities of interest. This is um, a super easy thing to do. You go out, you collect some tracking data, you draw lines between them, and you measure whatever it is you want to measure. The challenge is that this is also heavily, heavily biased. Um, so for example, uh, this is some simulated data. The blue line underneath that just popped up is the actual track that the animal moved along. And you can see there's a major disconnect between the straight line interpolation and the actual path that the animal traveled. And that's because the straight line interpolation doesn't actually mimic, it doesn't treat this as movement data. It doesn't think that there's gonna be any type of correlation in, in, in um, positions or, or velocities in, as this animal moves. It's just a straight line interpolation. So, you know, unless the animal moved in a perfectly straight line, this is absolutely always going to underestimate result negative bias in, in estimating quantities from, from path lengths. 
And that's not something new and fancy. This is something you know that we 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 found. People have known this for decades. Um, the thing is, the solution to this challenge has just been to let's just ramp up the sampling frequency. Um, if we just increase the sampling, that should effectively function as like a Riemann sum of better uh, approximation of the curve, like some type of Riemann sum approximation of a curve, and um, do a much better job at, at um, figuring out what the actual path lengths were and getting better estimates. The challenge there, though, is that um, these data are also associated with some type of measurement error. And if measurement error is uncorrelated in time, the estimates will actually diverge to infinity as sampling intervals decrease. So the solution that they're proposing actually makes your estimates much worse um, than they, they might otherwise have been. And that happens because um, as the amount of time between any two locations is decreased, um, the, the amount of space that the animal had the potential to travel also decreases, but you have uncorrelated measurement error. So that is independent of T. And so these estimates can actually diverge to infinity as the time interval decreases. And really nobody has been thinking about that, that side of the coin. There's one paper that's kind of maybe focused on it, but it was in um, the computer science literature and, and it was not being read by ecologists. And so what that looks like is something like this, where this is your the true path that the animal might have traveled. And you go and you sample this path with measurement error. And when you have measurement error, uh, straight line interpolation um, totally fails here. And it introduces all sorts of movement that actually did not occur. And that puts you in sort of this, this Goldilocks situation where at really coarse scales, um, yeah, you might be able to estimate something like the path length well. But at really fine scales, you have your, your estimate uh, sorry, you, you get underestimated coarse coarse scales at intermediate scales. Yeah, you might might do okay, um, and then at fine scales, you introduce um, bias based on measurement error. And the only reason you get a region where this is behaving well is because you have these two sources of bias: one positive, one negative, canceling each other out. And you know, really relying on sources of bias to cancel out is not an appropriate approach to estimating things. So the solution, you know, what can you do if you're interested in, in estimating things from these data? Uh, the solution that we put together is based on working in continuous time and actually leveraging the autocorrelation structure of the data and working with the location error in the data and modeling it appropriately. All of these things were, were new to the field and had not been done prior to, uh, not been done in an effective way prior to um, some work that we did recently. The way the method works is, of course, you need data. So first step is getting, going out there and collecting data, um, calibrating your measurement error, um, which is a step that is almost universally ignored in the field of movement ecology, um, so that you can actually uh, have an appropriate description of the error around each location and not treat it as a, as a known. Um, modeling, modeling the movement process and, and identifying the models that capture, you know, fine scale features that happen on the order of seconds to minutes and long scale features in the data that happen on the order of days to months and finding the best models that capture all of those features. And then uh, instead of doing straight line linear interpolation, actually doing model-based interpolation that incorporates both the movement process and measurement error into um, your estimate. And then you, you simulate a path and you estimate whatever it is you might be interested in, whatever latent variable you're interested in. And then you repeat that over multiple rounds of sil uh, simulation to, to recreate the distribution of all the potential paths that could have occurred. And that gives you a mean a point estimate on, on these things that you can work with and variance around that estimate from which you can get confidence intervals, which um, straight line interpolation does not give you access to. Um, so, you know, compared to straight line interpolation, this is a lot of, a lot of extra work. You got to fit models, you got to model error, and you got to do all these things. Is it actually worth it? Um, we did some simulation based tests and all these figures, the red line is going to be continuous time, uh, methods that we were developing. And we're going to just show it now for estimating distance traveled. Uh, the continuous time method uh, and, and, and all the results are scaled such that such that the truth is equal to one. Um, 
and the straight line distance is in blue, straight line interpolation based methods, and uh, sort of semi model smooth uh, straight line distance approach is in yellow. I'm not going to talk too much about that. Um, so focusing on the red ones is what we put together and the blue ones is sort of the conventional method. Um, if you modify a sampling frequency, again, you see this sort of uh, scale dependency in the straight line distance approach and the scale de dependency in the continuous time approach just totally disappears. Um, modifications of the velocity autocorrelation time scale movement process. So basically not changing the sampling, but changing the underlying movement process. The scale dependency is there present in the straight line interpolation based methods again, um, but it disappears with the continuous time simulation based approaches. Um, also really stable to variation in uh, measurement error, unlike again, the dependency in straight line distance and robust to just totally random data loss as well. So the method does perform well. It gives you pretty good stability across a whole range of different issues that might come up in your data, disconnect between the sampling and the movement, and also random data loss and measurement error. So it does perform pretty well. It's, you know, sits at the truth fairly consistently, which is what you hope an estimator should be doing. Um, okay, those are simulated cases. You might say that that's, you know, <clears throat> um, a situation that we've sort of groomed to work out well. Does it perform well on the empirical data as well? Um, so we tested this with some tracking data from Okwadi, and we saw very similar effects where um, data thinning resulted in scale dependency in the straight line interpolation methods and um, that consistent performance across the continuous time methods. And we tested this on a whole bunch of different species as well and saw that it had that same um, good performance, both that we were seeing on the simulation data, uh, on the empirical data. And so we did it on some, some other species as well. Here's data from a wood turtle. The thing to note here is um, these circles represent measurement error. And you can see that the measurement error in this data is absolutely massive. It's a turtle, it doesn't move very much, and there's it's accompanied by a massive amount of measurement error. And, um, if you would use the conventional straight line interpolation, you would have estimated, had an estimate that I think uh, in this one was on the order of um, 15 times too high. So saying the animal moves way more than it actually did. And, you know, not just for mean estimates of, of, the, um, of the, the whole sampling period, but uh, as well as um, daily distance traveled as well. So if you just want to know how much it moved on any given day, this straight line interpolation approach introduces all sorts of not noise um, that might correlate well with um, any type of biological covariate, but as we've just seen, is it's purely a function of measurement error. And so there's no actual biological signal in this blue trend. In fact, what, what is more appropriate is just um, sort of slow and steady movement, as you might expect from a turtle. Um, the method, of course, does have a few limitations. It's conditional on a fitted movement model. So if the movement model is not a, an appropriate descriptor of the data, it's going to introduce some bias. So for example, here, um, the brown is uh, the actual movement speed of the animal at a given point in time, and the red is the estimate. Uh, and it's an animal that has this stop and go type movement, move, rest, move, rest. If the model doesn't capture that, you can, you can result in some overestimation in some time periods. Any method that relies on a movement model or on a model is subject to this type of thing. If the model is not an appropriate descriptor, you get some bias. Um, but that just means that there's uh, the potential to improve these models to improve the accuracy of the method going forward. Um, there is a certain range of models that this thing uh, can rely on. So it's not appropriate for all, all models um, that, that uh, can be applied to movement data. But again, it's this thing where um, if you have a good, good model and an appropriate model for the data, um, you, you do get this nice performance. And um, another limitation is that it requires um, an appropriate description of the measurement error. If you don't have the error model properly, you, you get a lot of instability in it as well. Um, but the nice thing too here is that it's not just for, for speed and distance travel, it can be extended to any other path derived latent variable. Um, so if you want to know like how much time species are spending in, in 
you know, a certain area, you can get a lot of improvement from, from this type of approach. If you want to know how much they're crossing roads, again, you get a lot more improvement compared to straight line linear interpolation. Um, <clears throat> main take home though from, from all this is that you know, movement ecology is in pretty much this golden age where um, we now have the capacity to collect data for an abundance of species, really high quality data. And if we use it properly and effectively, we can know a lot about how these species are behaving and protect, protect them in a reasonable way. Um, as a major challenge though, you know, inappropriate statistics when applied to these data result in severe amount of bias that end up dominating estimates. We do have good continuous time methods for um, estimating some of the key quantities that people might be interested in, in estimating. So there are solutions for working with these data, um, but a major challenge has been uptake uh, by the community. Uh, and so, you know, this is why our, our research program is focused not just on developing the methods, but also on describing how they function in very clean, easy to accessible ways so that um, the community can be confident in the way that they perform and also um, understand why it's important for them to use these different methods. Um, so, you know, methods development is progressing and um, going well for the past decade or so, um, but still uptake by the community is a major hurdle that we're trying to overcome. And so with that, thank you and um, happy to take any questions if there's time. <laughs>